Chapter 3. That Psychology Has a New Dispensation. Reflection on Jung's Answer to Job. We should bend to the great task of reinterpreting all the Christian traditions, and since it is a question of truths which are anchored deep in the soul, the solution of this task must be possible. C.G. Jung, Answer to Job. In the spring of 1951, at the age of 75, in a sudden burst of inspiration during a febrile illness, Jung wrote a little essay. It was virtually dictated to him from the unconscious, and as soon as it was completed, his illness was over. In July 1951, he writes, If there is anything like the spirit seizing one by the scruff of the neck, it was the way this book came into being. Two years later, he described it in terms of a musical composition and a drama. The book came to me during the fever of an illness. It was as if accompanied by the great music of Bach or Handel. I just had the feeling of listening to a great composition, or rather of being at a concert. The experience of the book was for me a drama that was not mine to control. I felt myself utterly the causa ministerialis of my book. It came upon me suddenly and unexpectedly during a feverish illness. I feel its content as the unfolding of the divine consciousness in which I participate, like it or not. In his old age, Jung remarked that he wished he could rewrite all of his books except this one. With this book, he was completely satisfied. He called it Answer to Job. At the outset, let me state candidly my appraisal of this book. In my opinion, it has the same psychic depth and import as characterized the major scriptures of the world religions. In accordance with the modern mind, it differs from these scriptures in its modesty of expression and in the objective consciousness that illuminates it. One should not be deceived by its personal, unpretentious style. It is the very quality that demonstrates its authenticity. Although he describes the most profound encounters between the ego and the archetypal psyche, Jung never falls into an identification with the archetype. His attitude is always that of the limited human ego. It is never inflated or grandiose. Although the style is modest, the content is of such depth as to be beyond our current power to assimilate. It lays the groundwork for a new world view, a new myth for modern man, a new dispensation that connects man to the transpersonal psyche in a new way. In Jung's word, his as insights may well involve a tremendous change in the God image. In confino mortis, and in the evening of a long and eventful life, a man will often see immense vistas of time stretching out before him. Such a man no longer lives in the everyday world and in the vicissitudes of personal relationships, but in the sight of many eons and in the movement of ideas, and they pass from century to century. In these words, Jung describes John, the author of Revelation, but they apply also to Jung himself. As Jung engages himself with Job's ideal, the centuries that separate the two men dissolve. Jung has quite literally given a definitive answer to Job's question. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter soul? This fact seems so evident to me that I do not consider it extravagant to link Jung with Job's words. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. These are the latter days and Jung's insight is indeed Job's Redeemer. The title of this chapter speaks of a new dispensation, but there can be no question of a new dispensation as long as one is comfortably contained in the old one. Jung writes, I am not addressing myself to the happy possessions of faith, but to those many people for whom the light has gone out. The mystery has faded, and God is dead. For most of them, there is no going back, and one does not know either whether going back is the better way. To gain an understanding of religious matters, probably all that is left us today is a psychological reproach. That is why I take these thought forms that have become historically fixed, try to melt them down again, and pour them into molds of media experience. The psychological approach to religious imagery is not available at any depth to one who is contained in a particular religious myth. Jung is quite explicit about this. I do not write for believers who already possess the whole truth, rather for unbelieving but intelligent people who want to understand something. The believer will learn nothing from my answer to Job, since he already has everything. I write only for unbelievers. Nothing here for the believing Christians. 
Since the Judeo-Christian myth is at the foundation of the Western psyche, we are all believers to some extent, either consciously or unconsciously. That is, we all have some residual psychic containment in that myth. This means that answer to Job will be cause of offense or misunderstanding for practically everybody. I must make a distinction here between containment and relatedness. It is, of course, possible to be related, indeed lovingly related, to a particular religion, church, or religious community without being contained in it. Containment is an unconscious phenomenon of psychic identification. One can be contained in a religion just as one can be contained in a family or other collective group. Uh, one then has no residual living relation to the numinous archetypes. Relatedness to a religion, however, means connecting with it out of one's individual numinous experience. In the latter case, we have not a community of believers, but rather a community of knowers, or better, a community of individuals, each of whom is a carrier of the living experience of the self. Although Jung specifically states that he addresses those for whom God is dead, he also points out that the archetypal theme of the death of God is a part of the Christian myth. Christ himself is the typical dying and self-transforming God. Christ died, but he was not to be found in his tomb. Why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He writes. The myth says he was not to be found where his body was laid. Body means the outward, visible form. The erstwhile but ephemeral setting for the highest value. The myth further says that the value rose again in a miraculous manner, transformed. It looks like a miracle, for when a value disappears, it always seems to be lost irretrievably. So, it is quite unexpected that it should come back. The three days descent to hell during death describes the sinking of the vanished value into the unconscious, where, by conquering the power of darkness, it establishes a new order, and then rises up to heaven again. That is, attains supreme clarity of consciousness. The fact that only few people see the Risen One means that no small difficulties stand in the way of finding and recognizing the transformed value. In answer to Job, Jung submits the basic myth of the Western Psyche to an intense conscious scrutiny. He accepts the imagery as psychic reality and follows the implications of the images all the way to their conclusions. This has never been done before, as Jung says. It is altogether amazing how little most people reflect on the numinous objects and attempt to come to terms with them, and how laborious such an undertaking is once we have embarked upon it. The numinosity of the object makes it difficult to handle intellectually, since our affectivity is always involved. One always participates for or against. If one is a religious believer, he will be afraid of acknowledging his unconscious doubt. If one has no religious beliefs, he will be afraid to admit his sense of spiritual emptiness. These are the two most common sources of offense to the readers of Answer to Job. Either one is offended that Jung describes Yahweh so outrageously, in contradiction to the dogmatic God image in which he believes, or one is offended that Jung takes so seriously the primitive anthropomorphic image of God that has long since been discredited by the rational intellect. I venture to assert that every person on first encounter with answer to Job will be offended to some extent, in either one or the other, or perhaps both of these ways. Whoever is gravely offended will have nothing more to do with answer to Job, and that is proper since one man's meat can be another man's poison. If, however, one begins to reflect on how it is that this supposedly wise and gifted man can have such strange ideas, one may be led to the discovery of the reality of the psyche. What most people overlook or seem unable to understand, writes Ian, is the fact that I regard the psyche as real. This is the essential issue. The reality of the psyche has only been discovered in this century, and very few people are yet aware of it. Answer to Job is written out of a profound awareness of this reality. Next to a personal analysis, the serious study of Answer to Job, along with Ewing's other writings, is perhaps the best way to discover the reality of the psyche for oneself. At the beginning of Answer to Job, Jung says, I found myself advised to deal with the whole Job problem, and I do so in the form of describing a personal experience carried by subjective emotions. I deliberately chose this form because I wanted to avoid the impression that I had any idea of, a, of announcing an eternal truth. The book does not pretend to be anything but the voice or question of one individual. The fact is that he does announce an eternal truth, and I think he knew it. 
The statement is that of a very wise and canny man who knows how to approach and talk about the luminosum. Answer of Job is a psychological commentary on the entire Hebrew Christian myth as it is enshrined in the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments. The Bible contains highly numinous archetypal contents, which are dangerous to approach under certain conditions. It is relatively safe only when one is functioning out of one's unique individual wholeness. This accounts for Jung's prefatory statement and for the very personal, subjective approach which he uses throughout Answer to Job. Indeed, in this book, Jung gives as an example of how to deal with the activated unconscious. It must be engaged vigorously with all our powers of mind and heart. The Bible is dangerous only for one who is aware of psychic reality. It is not dangerous for one who is embedded in a religious orthodoxy. In that case, the powerful archetypal images, like wild animals, are safely caged behind the bars of a creed. The Bible is also safe when approached from a purely rational intellectual standpoint, as do the biblical scholars. In that case, it is as if one studied pictures of Africa and its wild animals, but if one is open to the unconscious and to the psychic reality, then to approach the numinous contents of the Bible is like going on a real African safari and meeting the untamed powers of life face to face. Psychologically, the danger is inflation, to be eaten up by an archetype. The best protection is to be connected with one's wholeness, most definitely including one's dark and guilty limitation. As Jung tells us, in these circumstances it is well to remind ourselves of St. Paul and his split consciousness. On one side he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God, and on the other side a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in his flesh. Marie-Louise von Franz reports that when Jung was once asked how he could live with the knowledge he had recorded in answer to Job, he replied, I live in my deepest hell, and from there I cannot fall any further. The central theme of answer to Job as of the Hebrew Christian myth is the relationship between man and Yahweh. Jung deals with this issue in terms of psychic reality, and we will be able to understand him only if we know what Yahweh is as a psychic reality. The question is, what does Yahweh mean psychologically? In a 1933 seminar, Jung made these remarks. For the collective unconscious, we could use the word God, but I prefer not to use big words. I am quite satisfied with the humble scientific language because it has the great advantage of bringing that whole experience into our immediate vicinity. You all know what the collective unconscious is. You have certain dreams that carry the hallmark of the collective unconscious. Instead of dreaming of Aunt This or Uncle That, you dream of a lion, and the analyst will tell you that this is a mythological motif and you will understand that it is the collective unconscious. This God is no longer miles of abstract space away from you in an extra mundane sphere. This divinity is not a concept in a theological textbook or in the Bible. It is an immediate thing. It happens in your dreams at night. It causes you to have pains in the stomach, diarrhea, constipation, a whole host of neuroses. If you try to formulate it to think what the unconscious is after all, you wind up concluding that is what the prophets were concerned with. It sounds exactly like some things in the Old Testament. Their God sends plagues upon people. He burns their bones in the night. He injures their kidneys. He causes all sorts of troubles. Then you come to naturally to the dilemma. Is that really God? Is God a neurosis? Now, that is a shocking dilemma, I admit. But when you think consistently and logically, you come to the conclusion that God is a most shocking problem. And that is the truth. God has shot people out of their wits. Think what he did to poor old Hosiah. He was a respectable man and he had to marry a prostitute. Probably he suffered from a strange kind of mother complex. 25 years later in 1958, he writes the following an important letter to Morton Kelsey. The absence of human morality in Yahweh is a stumbling block which cannot be overlooked as little as the fact that nature, i.e. God's creations, does not give us enough reason to believe it or to be purposive or reasonable in the human sense. We miss reason and moral values, that is, two main characteristics of the mature human mind. It is therefore obvious that the Yahwistic image or conception of the deity is less than that of certain human specimens. The image of a personified brutal force and of an unethical and non-spiritual mind yet inconsistent enough to exhibit traits of kindness and generosity between a violent power drive. It is the picture of a sort of 
nature demon and at the same time of a primitive chieftain aggrandized to a colossal size. Just the sort of conception one could accept, expect of a more or less barbarous society. This image owes its extensive certainty not to an invention or intellectual formulation, but rather to a spontaneous manifestation, i.e. to religious experience of men like Samuel and Job, and thus it retains its vitality to this day. People still ask, is it possible that God allows such things? Even the Christian God may be asked, why do you let your only son suffer for the imperfection of your creation? This most shocking defectuosity of the God image ought to be explained or understood. The nearest analogy to it is our experience of the unconscious. It is a psyche whose nature can only be described by paradoxes. It is personal as well as impersonal, moral and amoral, just and unjust, ethical and unethical, of cunning intelligence and at the same time blind, immensely strong and extremely weak. This is the psychic foundation which produces the raw material for our conceptual structures. The unconscious is a piece of nature our mind cannot comprehend. It can only sketch models of a possible and partial understanding. In answer to Job, Hume writes, It is only through the psyche that we can establish the God acts upon us, but we are unable to distinguish whether these actions emanate from God or from the unconscious. We cannot tell whether God and the unconscious are two different entities. Both are borderline concepts for transcendental contents. But empirically, it can be established with a sufficient degree of probability that there is in the unconscious an archetype of wholeness. Strictly speaking, the God image does not coincide with the unconscious as such, but with this special content of it, namely the archetype of the self. Shortly before his death in 1961, he was asked by an interviewer about his idea of God. He replied, To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. Summarizing all these quotations, we can see that Yahweh as a psychic reality is a personification of the collective unconscious, especially in its aspect of center and totality, the self. It expresses itself in dreams and fantasies of an archetypal nature. It affects instincts and intense energy manifestations of all kinds, in psychic and somatic symptoms, and in its specific quality of otherness, which goes contrary to the desires and expectations of the ego. Since the phenomena of synchronicity imply a fluid boundary between inner and outer reality, the unconscious can come to us from without as well as from within. Hence, you can say, God is reality itself. Answer to Job begins with an examination of Job's encounter with Yahweh. The book of Job can be considered as the pivot of the Old Testament. Here for the first time, Yahweh engages a man as an individual rather than as the representative of Israel, the collective nation. This book thus marks the transition from collective psychology to individual psychology. From the election of a people to the election of an individual who must now encounter the numinosum, on his own without the supporting containment of identification with a nation or a creed. Jung obviously felt that his encounter with the unconscious paralleled Job's encounter with Yahweh. Thus he writes, The Western God image is the valid one for me. Whether I assent to it intellectually or not, I do not go in for religious philosophy, but I am held in thrall, almost crushed, and defend myself as best I can. My living thraldom is local, barbaric, infantile, and abysmally unscientific. Jung was appalled by the way Yahweh treated Job, just as he must have been appalled by the torture which he, Jung, had to endure in this encounter with the unconscious. In a 1932 seminar, he expresses himself vividly. When Yahweh was to play a particularly bad stunt on Job, he held a meeting with the devil, and they discussed what they could launch on that poor fellow on earth. It is just as if men had come together to deliberate what they could do to pester and tease a dog. It was exceedingly immoral, but that was not seen then, or people would not have been so naive about it. By reliving Job's experience and by bringing to it a modern consciousness, Ewan has discovered an astonishing new meaning of the experience. By standing his ground and remaining true to his own conscious judgment, Job did not succumb to the moral condemnation of his comforters, and thus, created the very obstacle that forced God to reveal his true nature. Since Job did not fall victim to the 
proposition that all good is from God and all bad from man, he was able to see God and recognize his behavior to be that of an unconscious being who cannot be judged morally. Yahweh is a phenomenon and, as Job says, not a man. The result is that the man, Job, because of his conscious awareness, is raised above Yahweh and further. If Job gains knowledge of God, then God must also learn to know himself. It just could not be that Yahweh's dual nature should become public property and remain hidden from himself alone. Whoever knows God has an effect on him. The failure of the attempt to corrupt Job has changed Yahweh's nature. In other words, the encounter with the creature changes the creator. According to Rivka Gluger, Jung once put it this way, In his great final speech, God reveals himself to Job in all his frightfulness. It is as if he said to Job, Look, that's what I am like. That is why I treat you like this. Through the suffering which he inflicted upon Job out of his own nature, God has come to this self-knowledge and admits, as it were, this knowledge of the frightfulness to Job. And that is what redeems man, Job. This is really the solution to the enigma of Job. That is, a true justification for Job's fate, which without this background would in its cruelty and injustice remain an open problem. Job appears here clearly as a sacrifice, but also as a carrier of the divine fate, and that gives meaning to his suffering and liberation to his soul. Job is a sacrifice for Yahweh's developing consciousness, the outward occasion for an inner process of dialectic in God. Here we have a truly revolutionary realization, one that will surely take centuries to pass into general awareness. As previously mentioned, Job is the pivotal book of the Old Testament. Considered psychologically, the Old Testament as a whole represents a vast individuation process unfolding in the collective psyche. Its pivotal crisis is Job and the culmination is the Mandala vision of Ezekiel. This vision is really a foundation image of the Western psyche. How fundamental it is is indicated by the fact that Jung uses it as the basis for his most differentiated model of the psyche. He is found in the first chapter of Ezekiel and reads as follows. As I looked, a storm wind came from the north, a huge cloud with flashing fire, from the midst of which something gleamed like electrum. Within it were figures resembling four living creatures that looked like this. Their form was human, but each had four faces and four wings, and their legs went straight down. The soles of their feet were rounded. They sparkled with a gleam like burnished bronze. Their faces were like this. Each of the four had the face of a man, but on the right side was the face of a lion, and on the left side the face of an ox, and finally, each had the face of an eagle. Their faces and their wings looked out on all four sides. They did not turn when they moved, but each went straight forward. Human hands were under the wings, and the wings of one touched those of another. Each had two wings spread out above so that they touched one another, while the other two wings of each covered his body. In among the living creatures, something like burning coals of fire could be seen. They seemed like torches, moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire gleamed, and from it came forth flashes of lightning. As I looked at that living creature, I saw wheels on the ground, one beside each other of the four living creatures. The wheels had the sparkling appearance of chrysolite, and all four of them looked the same. They were constructed as though one wheel were within another. They could move in any of the four directions they faced without veering as they moved. The four of them had rims, and I saw that their rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creature moved, the wheels moved with them, and when the living creatures were raised from the ground, the wheels also were raised. Wherever the spirit wished to go, there the wheels went, and they were raised together with the living creatures, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, something like a firmament could be seen, seeming like glittering crystal stretched across out above their heads. Beneath the firmament, their wings were stretched out, one toward the other. Each of them had two covering his body. Then I heard the sound of their wings, like the roaring of mighty waters, like the voice of the Almighty. When they moved, the sound of the tumult was like the din of an army. Above the firmament over the head, something like a throne could be seen, looking like sapphire. Upon it was seated, up above, one who had the appearance of a man. Upward from what resembled his waist, I saw it gleamed like electrum, 
downwards from what resembled his waist, I saw what looked like fire. He was surrounded with splendor, like the bow which appears in the clouds on rainy day was the splendor that surrounded him. Such was the vision of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This magnificent vision is the most differentiated image of the Numenosum to be found in the Old Testament. Earlier versions of the Numenosum, which this vision echoes, are the pillar of cloud by day on the pillar of fire by night, the burning bush out of which Yahweh spoke to Moses, and the cloud that hovered over the tabernacle. The Ezekiel vision is a mandala, the type of symbolic image that marks the peak experience of the individuation process as it is observed in psychotherapy. We can thus consider this vision to have the same meaning in the collective individuation process of which the Old Testament is a re record. It is the culmination of the Old Testament, psychologically understood, and the starting point for later Jewish mysticism, as well as much Kabbalistic speculation. The imagery of this vision was also taken over into Christian mandalas, in which the four evangelists correspond to the four creatures of Ezekiel's vision and make up the four pillars of the throne of Christ. Now, depth psychology, once again, uses this great visionary image as a model for the archetype of the self. Yahweh suffered a moral defeat in his encounter with Job, and the unannounced result was that man was elevated above Yahweh. This required Yahweh to catch up with man. God must now become man, but he must now incarnate. Jung describes how the vision of Ezekiel reveals the elevation of man. The first great vision is made up of two well-ordered com compound quaternities, that is, conceptions of totality, such as we frequently observe today as spontaneous phenomenon. Their quinta essentia is represented by a figure which has the likeness of a human form. Here Ezekiel has seen the essential content of the unconscious, namely, the idea of the higher man by whom Yahweh was morally defeated and who he was later to become. Ezekiel grasped in a symbol the fact that Yahweh was drawing closer to man, this is something which came to Job as an experience, but probably did not reach his consciousness. That is to say, he did not realize that his consciousness was higher than Yahweh's, and that, consequently, God wants to become man. What is more, in Ezekiel, we must we meet for the first time the title Son of Man, which Yahweh significantly uses in addressing the prophet, presumably to indicate that he is a son of man on the throne, and hence a prefiguration of the much later revelation in Christ. The term Son of Man, which was applied to Enoch, to Ezekiel, and to the Messiah, is enigmatic. Jung says this about it. Ezekiel witnesses the humanization and differentiation of Yahweh. By being addressed as Son of Man, it is intimated to him that Yahweh's incarnation and quaternity are, so to speak, the pleromatic model for what is going to happen. Through the transformation and humanization of God, not only to God's Son as foreseen from all eternity, but to man as such. This means that Ezekiel's vision, which shows God in the forms of a man, indicates that Yahweh has already undergone human incarnation in the Pleroma, i.e. in the unconscious. Thus, henceforth, the term Son of God will be synonymous with the term Son of Man, since God has become a man. Mankind is now caught up in the process of divine transformation. God has fallen into man and man has become a participant in the divine drama. This fact remained on the symbolic projected level as long as the process was confined to one man, Christ, who was worshipped as divine. But now, with the psychological understanding of this imagery, the experience becomes available potentially to all individuals. The lowering of the relative status of Yahweh was also picked up as a major theme in Gnosticism. Waldabaoth, the Gnostic Demiurge who created the world and was equated with Yahweh, is described in Gnostic texts as ignorant and conceited. According to one text quoted by Hans Jonas, he boasted, I am Father and God and there is none above me, to which his mother, the Lord Sophia, retorts, Do not lie, Waldabaoth. There is above thee, the father of all, the first man, and the man, the son of man. Jonas says, This elevation of man to a transmundane deity, prior and superior to the creator of the universe, or the assigning of that name to such a deity, is one of the most significant traits of the Gnostic theology. It signifies a new metaphysical status of man in the order of image.
We encounter the same image of primitive unconscious God in need of enlightenment in modern dreams. For example, a woman dreamed, I am driving through a desert. There is a terrible evil thing, a gorilla ape man that is destroying people. I see some personal objects scattered about and fear that some people have had an encounter with the ape and have been destroyed. I feel safe in my car. Then I see it up ahead. I quickly lock the doors in my car and figure that I will drive around him and go get away by sheer speed. When I see it approach rapidly and see that I cannot avoid it, I decide to crash into it and stun it and thus get away. But at that moment, we connect my car is turned all around and it grabs onto the car. Then something incredible happens. There is a blue light, a blue aura all around us and I hear a voice talking to me, but through a kind of mental telepathy. It is the ape talking directly to my mind. He is talking about God incarnated on earth and about Christ and the true meaning of Christianity. The effect is as moving and powerful as I have experienced at times when I read the New Testament. I am amazed because I had seen it as the ultimate destructive force on earth and it turns out that it has some important messages. After the encounter, I do not feel morally threatened anymore. Maybe it wants to redeem me from my lowly unspiritual state, or perhaps it wants me to redeem him from the same. This profound dream pictures the current state of the ego of Western man vis-a-vis -vis God. We are now about to encounter the dark side of God, the Deus Absentitus, which has been left out of account in our traditional formulations. And there is the hint that, in this encounter, God will need the help of man. A man had this dream after reading the answer to Job. I see a huge ape-like man without a neck. His huge head is attached directly to his shoulders. He is naked and is looking lasciviously at a woman. I feel that he must be trained, so I ask him to put on his clothes. He expels flash loudly and leaves the room. The dreamer associated the ape-like man to Yahweh and also to an autistic boy of his acquaintance connect such a dream with God is, of course, exceedingly offensive to the traditional viewpoint. And yet, this is the sort of shocking fact that we meet when we use the empirical method of exploring the psyche. As Jung says, God is a most shocking problem. The idea of an unconscious God that needs man is exceedingly difficult for the traditional Western mind to accept. Even Jung's gifted pupil and colleague, Eric Neumann, was not able to accept it. In a 1959 letter to Jung, he wrote, what is creation for? The answer, that what shines only in itself when unreflected may shine in infinite variety is age old, but satisfies me. To this, you replied. Since a creation without the reflecting consciousness of man has no discernible meaning, the hypothesis of a latent meaning endows man with a cosmogonic significance, a true raison d'etre. If, on the other hand, the latent meaning is attributed to the Creator as part of a conscious plan of creation, the question arises, why should the Creator stage manage this whole phenomenal world since he already knows what he can reflect himself in, and why should he reflect himself at all since he is already conscious of himself? Why should he create alongside his own omniscience a second inferior consciousness? Millions of dreary little mirrors when he knows in advance just what the image they reflect will look like. After thinking all this over, I have come to the conclusion that being made in the likeness applies not only to man, but also to the Creator. He resembles man or is his likeness, which is to say that he is just as unconscious as man or even more unconscious, since according to the myth of the Incarnatio, he actually felt obliged to become man and offer himself to man as a sacrifice. Another friend of Jung's provides a more painful example. Father Victor White, a Catholic priest, was unable to accept Jung's interpretation of Job. He expressed this criticism in a review of Answer to Job, from which I shall quote at length because it illustrates the common phenomenon of containment in a religious faith combined with a reductive, personalistic attitude toward the psyche. Father White wrote, is it profitable or even sensible to analyze a patient's God without analyzing the patient or without even a glance at his case history? Can it be irrelevant to all that follow? As opening verses of the book of Job tells us, Job is materially prosperous and spiritually complacent, that he eschews evil, that he is driving his children to drink, that he is anxiety-ridden with the suspicion that they precisely 
dot blasphemy, and that he is trying to ward off this anxiety with continual, seemingly obsession or ritual. Is not the subsequent prologue in heaven clearly a reflection of this prologue on earth, the God-Satan split, a projection of Job's own ego shadow split? Can we treat archetypal antics as autonomous, independently of Job's disturbed and anxious ego? And is it not symptomatic of the same split of ego from shadow that, as Job intensifies his repressions, his wife Anima is sick and tired of his infantile piety, his Satan destroys his children, produces psychosomatic boils, and drives him to withdraw from life to the dunghill. Is not the rationalistic talk with the three friends typical of the agony and futility of neurotic rationalization in the presence of unconscious existential guilt, mistaken for moral guilt? But most of all, I am driven to ask, what lesson, as a pupil in psychology, am I supposed to derive from it all? That we can legitimately transfer our personal splits and ill to our gods and archetypes, and put the blame on them? If so, of what greater use of psychology, or indeed humanity's struggle for liberation from the tyranny of dark gods during the past three millennia? Or are the critics right who consider that Jungians have become so possessed by archetypes that they are in danger of abandoning elementary personal psychology altogether? This strikes this is a striking example of how talking about an archetypal image can constantly in one's own surrounding. By taking Job's side, Jung has encouraged others to identify him with Job. Father White does this and then lives out the role of one of Job's comforters by chastising Jung. I would draw your attention in Father White's critique to the expression, his Satan and our gods and archetypes. These expressions reveal his personalistic misunderstanding of the archetypal psyche. This is inevitable in an individual for whom the archetypal psyche remains contained in a religious faith. In that case, the archetypes are understood as metaphysical entities and have not yet appeared as psychic realities. For such a person, psychic images can have only personal reference and religious images. At least, the images of one's own religion can have only metaphysical reference. God has not yet fallen into the psyche. Jung replied to White's critical review in the letter. The letter is particularly gentle because Jung had just learned that Father White was suffering from an intestinal malignancy from which he died two months later at the age of 58. Now let us assume that Job is neurotic, as one can easily make out from the textual allusions. He suffers from a regrettable lack of insight into his own disassociation. He undergoes an analysis of sort by following Elihu's wise counsel. What he will hear and what he will be aware of are the discarded contents of his personal subconscious mind, of his shadow, but not the divine voice, as Eliahu intends. You faintly insinuate that I am committing Eliahu's error too, in appealing to archetype first and omitting the shadow. One cannot avoid the shadow unless one remains neurotic, and as long as one is neurotic, one has omitted the shadow. The shadow is the block which separates us more effectively from the divine voice. Therefore, Eliyahu, in spite of his fundamental truth, belongs to those foolish Jungians who, as you suggest, avoid the shadow and make for the archetypes, the divine equivalents, which, by the way, are nothing but escape camouflage, according to the personalistic theory. If Job succeeds in swallowing his shadow, he will be deeply ashamed of the things which had happened. He will see that he has only to accuse himself, for it is his complacency, his righteousness, his literal mindedness, etc., which have brought all the evil down upon him. He has not seen his own shortcomings, but has accused God. He will certainly fall into an abyss of despair and inferiority feelings, followed, if he survives, by profound repentance. He will even doubt his mental sanity, that he, by his vanity, has caused such an emotional turmoil even the delusion of divine interference, obviously a case of megalomania. After such an analysis, he will be less inclined than ever before to think that he has heard the voice of God, or has Freud with all his experience ever reached such a conclusion. If Job is to be considered as a neurotic and interpreted from the personalistic point of view, then he will end where psychoanalysis ends, these in disillusionment and resignation, where its creator most emphatically ended too. Since I thought this outcome is a bit unsatisfactory and also empirically not quite justifiable, I have suggested the hypothesis of archetypes as an answer to the problem raised by the shadow. 
Hume here expresses the crux of the matter. If the psychic images that express the numinosum, the supreme meaning and value of the psyche, are understood personalistically and reductively, the soul is destroyed and one is left with only disillusionment, resignation, and despair. If, however, like Job, one does not succumb to the personalistic, reductive interpretations of his internal agony and interpretation that tells him it is all his own fault, he may, like Job, be granted an experience of the nominosum, and that experience brings with it an awareness that the ego has a reason to exist. That is needed for the realization of the self. The personalistic reductive attitude belongs to a naive, uninitiated, ego-centered consciousness that knows no other psychic center but its own, Jung says. All modern people feel alone in the world of the psyche because they assume that there is nothing there that they have not made up. This is the very best demonstration of our God Almightiness, which simply comes from the fact that we think we have invented everything psychical, that nothing would be done if we did not do it. For that is our basic idea and it is an extraordinary assumption. Then one is all alone in one's psyche, exactly like the creator before the creation. But through a certain training, something suddenly happens which one has not created, something objective, and then one is no longer alone. That is the object of certain initiations, to train people to experience something which is not their intention, something strange, something objective with which they cannot identify. This experience of the objective fact is all important because it denotes the presence of something which is not I, yet is still psychical. Such an experience can reach the climax where it becomes an experience of God. Job did not take personal blame or responsibility for his woes, but rather insisted that he was not the creator of everything that happened to him. Psychologically, this would correspond to an ego attitude which does not identify with the phenomena of the objective psyche. Jung was once asked why patients chose to have certain psychological symptoms. He protested vigorously, saying that was like asking a man who had been devoured by a crocodile why he chose that particular one to eat him. When one has discovered the reality of the psyche, he is spared such mistakes. Likewise, he will not subscribe to the dictum, all good from God, all bad from man. As Jung says, this leads to the absurd result that the creature is placed in opposition to its creator and is positively cosmic or demonic grandeur and evil is imputed to man, which burdens him with the dark side of God. In other words, man becomes God's scapegoat. Hints of this realization are to be found in the Bible. For instance, in Psalm 51, the misere, which refers to David's guilt after being with Bethesda, we read, Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in your great tenderness, wipe away my faults, wash me clean of my guilt, purify me from my sin. For I am well aware of my faults. I have my sin constantly in mind. I have sinned against none other than you. Having done what you regard as wrong, that you may be found just when you pass sentence on me, blameless when you give judgment. In this passage, the astonishing realization is dying that God is justified by man. Speaking in psychological terms, the ego takes responsibility for the evil promptings of the self in order that the self may be transformed. A similar idea was expressed by Omar Khayyaman in the 11th century. O thou who didst with pitiful and with gin beset the road I was to wander in, thou wilt not with predestined evil round and mesh and then impute my fault to sin. O thou who made man of baser earth the snake, and in winds to paradise devised the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. Another aspect of Jung's revolutionary realization is this interpretation of the myth of incarnation. Since Yahweh had suffered a moral defeat by Job, man was elevated above God, and God must therefore become that superior creature, man. In Jung's word, the immediate cause of the incarnation lies in Job's elevation, and his purpose is a differentiation of Yahweh's consciousness. This differentiation is evidenced by the complete separatio that Yahweh undergoes with the advent of Christ. His two sides represented by his good son, Christ and his evil son, Satan are totally separated, indeed dissociated from each other. Christ becomes identical with Yahweh through the doctrine of the homusa, while Satan is cast out of heaven and thus condemned to live the life of dissociated autonomous complex. Herein lies the reason for Jung's observation that Yahweh's incarnation in Christ is incomplete. 
It left out of account Yahweh's dark side. This is reflected in the myth of the Immaculate Conception and the everlasting virginity of Mary, Yun writes. Her freedom from original sin sets Mary apart from mankind in general, whose common characteristic is original sin and therefore the need for redemption. The status on Lapsin is tantamount to a paradisal, i.e. pleromic and divine existence. By having these special measures applied to her, Mary is elevated to the status of a goddess and consequently loses something of her humanity. She will not conceive her child in sin, like all other mothers, and therefore he will also never be a human being, but a god. To my knowledge, at least, no one has ever perceived that this clears the pitch for the genuine incarnation of God, or rather, that the incarnation was only partially consummated. Both mother and son are not real human beings at all, but gods. The incarnation was incomplete. If it had been complete, the logical consequence, the parousa, would have taken place, but Christ was in error about it. The incomplete incarnation of Yahweh in Christ leads Jung to the idea of a continuing incarnation. This is already suggested by the Apostle Paul. Everyone moved by the Spirit is a son of God. The Spirit you receive is not the Spirit of slaves bringing fear into your lives again. It is the Spirit of sons, and it makes us cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself and our spirit bear united, bear united witness that we are children of God, and if we are children, we are heirs as well heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, sharing his sufferings so as to share his glory. The Gospel of John also implies a continuing incarnation. Christ says that when he leaves, he will send the paraclete. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all I have said to you. After citing this text, he says, the continuing direct operation of the Holy Ghost on those who are called to be God's children implies, in fact, a broadening process of incarnation. Christ, the Son begotten by God, is the firstborn who is succeeded by an ever-increasing number of younger brothers and sisters. From this viewpoint, the imitation of Christ takes on a new meaning. Christ's precepts as outer rules of behavior are no longer to be taken literally and concretely. Rather, one is to live his own reality as totally as Christ lived his. To the extent that one lives in conscious relation to the self, he will experience Christ as his brother, since Christ is our outstanding example of such a life. It is not an imitation of Christ, but its exact opposite, an assimilation of the Christ image to his own self. It is no longer an effort, an intentional striving after imitation, but rather an involuntary experience of the reality represented by the sacred legend. In psychological terms, the incarnation of God means individuation. To the extent that one becomes aware of the transpersonal center of the psyche, the self, and lives out of that awareness, one can be said to be incarnating the God image. This experience involves encounters with the opposites. The self is union of opposites. When it first emerges into consciousness, the opposites split apart and the ego is faced with the conflict of their opposition, Jung says. All opposites are of God, therefore man must bend to this burden, and in so doing he finds that God, in his oppositeness, has taken possession of him, incarnated himself in him. He becomes a vessel filled with divine conflict. God acts out of the unconscious of man and forces him to harmonize and unite the opposing influences to which his mind is exposed in the unconscious. The hallmark of individuation is the differentiation of the individual psyche from its containment in the collective psyche. The process is accompanied by a progressive awareness of the transpersonal psyche and the task of mediating and humanizing its energies. As soon as a more honest and more complete consciousness beyond the collective level has been established, writes Hume, man is no more an end in himself but becomes an instrument of God, and this is really so. The individuating ego is commandeered by the transpersonal psyche and drafted like Job into the service of making it more conscious. The ego is confronted with non-personal images and non-personal energies and its task will be to relate to these images and energies. The images require to be understanding and the energies as effects require containment and humanization. These images and affects can quite properly be called Yahweh images and Yahweh affects. They are expressions of the original unconscious self and, lacking any understanding of them by the ego, they are indistinguishable from so-called narcissism and infantile omnipotence. They are manifestations of ego self-identity. Jung refers to this when he says, 
We don't know how much of God has been transformed. It can be expected that we are going to contact spheres of the not yet transformed God when our consciousness begins to extend into the sphere of the unconscious. Once a conscious ego has established itself vis-a-vis -vis the transpersonal images and energies, it is no longer appropriate to use the reductive terminology of the infantile and the narcissistic. Now the appropriate terms will be found in the new myth of the continuing incarnation of God. As the ego wrestles with the transpersonal energies to humanize them, it will be reliving Jacob's encounter with the angel and Job's encounter with Yahweh. And like Job, we can expect to find within our antagonist the unconscious, also our redeemer. When the unconscious buffets us most severely with storms of affect or depression, we can also expect to find in dreams and fantasy the healing meaning that rescues. God has fallen out of containment in religion and into the unconscious of man, i.e. he is incarnated. Our unconscious is in an uproar with the God who wants to know and to be known, Jung writes. The unconscious wants to flow into consciousness in order to reach the light, but at the same time it continually thwarts itself because it would rather remain unconscious. That is to say, God wants to become man, but not quite. A modern dream that refers to the incarnation of Yahweh is relevant here. A man dreamed that he saw a primitive sorcerer holding up an animal skin. A living face was visible on the skin. It was a kind of oracle. The dreamer immediately associated the, prim the primitive sorcerer Yahweh. The animal skin reminded him of the fact that certain early manuscripts of the Bible were written on vellum. He associated the face to the image of Christ's face on Veronica's veil. He was also reminded of a flayed human skin with a face in Michelangelo's great mural of the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. The face of the flayed skin is a self-portrait of Michelangelo, who pictures himself as the flayed skin of St. Bartholomew, the Christian martyr who was flayed alive. This dream tells us that the primitive sorcerer, Yahweh, manifests through the animal skin containing the human face, i.e., he manifests through man. The events of the Bible are the evidence of Yahweh's written in the history of human beings. Just as his incarnation in Christ gave us a glimpse of his living face, in addition, the association to the face and flayed skin of Michelangelo suggests that the creative artist is a manifestation of the deity. Michelangelo's self-portrait indicates that he was identified with Marseus, the musician in Greek mythology who challenged Apollo to a musical contest and when he lost was flayed alive. The myth of Marcius applies to some extent to every creative artist and is also a feature of individuation inasmuch as acknowledging that living out of the connection with the self does involve a Marcius-like presumption, followed by torments. Flame symbolizes a transformation process which on the one hand lays bare the inner man and on the other hand signifies the extraction of the soul. A sonnet of Michelangelo's refers to the theme of flame. To others merciful and only to itself unkind, this early creature who slows off its skin in pain that it may give pleasure to others, dies that they may live. So do I long for such a destiny, that for my death, my lord, you might alone take life, then by my death I too might be changed like the worm which casts its skin on stone. For if that skin were mine, I could at least be woven in a gown to clasp the breast, and so embrace the beauty which I crave. Then would I gladly die, or could I save my lord's feet from the rain by being shoes upon his feet? This also would I choose. The idea of being shoes for God is an explicit incarnation image. Michelangelo is here giving expression to the most profound meaning of the flame motif. The words he wrote concerning Dante apply equally to him. He did not fear to plumb the places where failure alone survives. Returning to the dream, it seems to be saying that Yahweh manifests himself on man's skin. That is where he incarnates. Job belongs alongside of Christ, Marcius, and Michelangelo in this respect. Job got skinned by Yahweh, and we are granted a picture of Yahweh's face via the skin of Job, who risked his skin to contend with God like Marcius. This image is relevant to everyone who submits himself to the process of individuation. He will be offering up his skin to be a kind of vellum manuscript upon which Yahweh writes his revelations. 
At the beginning of the present era, the Jewish religion with its rich and profound tradition of man's encounter with Yahweh was recast and reinterpreted in the light of the new divine revelation in Christ. Man was thought to have a new relation to God, signified by a new covenant and a new dispensation. The Latin word dispensio was used to render the Greek oikonomia, which means literally administration of a household. The usage is illustrated in Ephesians where Paul says, To me, the least of all the saints, is given the grace to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to enlighten all men, that they may see what is the dispensation of the mystery which hath been hidden from eternity in God. The significant phrase is dispensation of the mystery. It is Though man's relation to the hidden mystery of God must be dispensed or administered much as the economy of a household is administered. In psychological terms it means, I think, the provision of a worldview that relates man, or his ego, to God, the archetypal psyche, and promotes the smooth transfer of energy from one realm to the other. The transition from one dispensation to another is demonstrated in the letter to the Hebrews, which was once attributed to Paul. The author states that the Jewish priesthood has been superseded by the eternal priesthood of Christ. The sacrificial offerings of the priest have been replaced by Christ's sacrifice of himself, and the temple sanctuary has been replaced by a heavenly sanctuary, not made by hands. Sacrifices no longer need be repeated. Christ's sacrifice has occurred once and for all, and when we only have faith in him to be redeemed. The author writes, Now Christ has come as the high priest of all the blessings which were to come. He has passed through the greater, the more perfect tent, which is better than the one made by men's hands, because it is not of this created order. And he has entered the sanctuary once and for all, taking with him not the blood of goats and bull calves, but his own blood having won an eternal redemption for us. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer are sprinkled on those who have incurred defilement, and they restore the holiness of their outward lives. How much more effectively the blood of Christ, who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to God through the eternal spirit, can purify our inner self from dead actions so that we do our service to the living God. This passage describes a process of transformation from a literal sacrificial ritual to one more spiritualized and abstract. It is a step toward the psychological realization of service to the self, but it concretizes the symbolic image of Christ and projects onto him the sacrificial function. The experience of the self thus remains collectivized and contained within the participation mystique of a religious community, although it will be nonetheless real for them. The Christian dispensation brought about a new okonomia to administer man's relation to the divine. That mode of administration is now largely exhausted, and, if my perception is accurate, a new mode is on the horizon, namely depth psychology. The new psychological dispensation finds man's relation to God and the individual's relation to the unconscious. This is the new context, the new vessel with which humanity can be the carrier of divine meaning. In essence, the Jewish dispensation was centered in the law. The Christian dispensation was centered in faith, and the psychological dispensation is centered in experience. God is now to be carried experientially by the individual. This is what is meant by the continuing incarnation. Jung puts it this way in the important letter to Ilanid Kochnik. Although the divine incarnation is a cosmic and absolute event, it only manifests empirically in those relatively few individuals capable of enough consciousness to make ethical decisions, to decide for the good. Therefore God can be called good only inasmuch as he is able to manifest his goodness in individuals. His moral quality depends upon individuals. That is why he incarnates. Individuation and individual existence are indispensable for the transformation of God the Creator. If the individual stands over against the primitive Yahweh effects within him, if he allows them to live without repressing them and without identifying with them, if he struggles to extract the image of meaning that lie embedded in them, if he patiently and diligently seeks the way of individuation which the unconscious both reveals and withholds, then his efforts will have a gradual transformative effect on Yahweh. 
He will be offering himself as a crucible for the transformation of a dark god and contributing his widow's might to the cosmic drama of continuing creation.